welcome and welcome to the tobacco online policy seminar tops thank you for joining us today i am ravindra singh thakur a post doctoral scholar at the ohio state university tops is organized by mike pesco at university of missouri c sang at the ohio state university michael dadden at the john hopkins university and jimmy hartman boys at university of massachusetts amherst the seminar will be one hour with the questions from moderator and discussant the audience may post questions and comments in qa panel and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter please review the guidelines on the tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards even if they are not read out aloud your questions are very much appreciated this presentation has been video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the tops website topspolicy.org i will turn the presentation over to today's moderator c sang from the ohio state university to introduce our speaker thank you Today, we continue our summer 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Ali Goli entitled Making a Smooth Exit, Menthol Bans and Cigarette Sales in Massachusetts. Ali Goli is an assistant professor of marketing at the University of Washington's Michael G. Foster School of Business. His research focuses on field experiments in two-sided platforms marketing and public policy, advertising and online vision. He published papers on the effects of tobacco marketing and the counter-marketing initiatives, including studies on regional and retail format bans, as well as cigarette product placements. His work on two-sided platforms investigates personalization techniques and methods to reduce interference bias. He received his PhD from the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. Dr. Simha Mumulat Neni, Assistant Professor of Marketing at Chapman University, is a co-author of the paper, and he will be helping to answer questions in Q&A. Our discussion today is Dr. Michael Darden from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Ali Goli, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you very much uh, for having me. I, I will just jump right in. Uh, I will start sharing the slides. Uh, let's see. Can you see the slides? Uh, uh, yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks for having us here. I, I have tried to keep this presentation fairly multidisciplinary. So we're not going to you know, have uh, lots of you know, econometric stuff like that. But but we are going to try to, you know, communicate uh, as much as we can in this short amount of time. Uh, first of all, I want to um, uh, sort of uh, thank people who organize TOPS. Uh, and they have been very helpful in, in, in guiding us how to present uh, and, and communicate the results. This is our funding disclosure. This research received no funding from any source. Uh, and let's jump right in. So this research was motivated by something that happened recently. By recent, I mean about two years ago. So FDA proposed that they want to prohibit mental cigarettes and flavored cigars. And uh, we were like, how can we study the effect of this? And wh why are sort of menthols special in this case? So menthols, as many of you might already know, are, are a flavor additive that are added to cigarettes. It gives them a minty taste, a cooling sensation. In the 2009, the Tobacco Control Act banned flavored cigarettes, but there was a special carve out for menthols. And menthols represent a large portion of cigarette sales, about 30 some percent or roughly $27 billion in revenue. So about 18 million Americans are smoking menthols. Now, the population that smokes menthols are also of interest to policymakers. Uh, the population is, is mostly African-American or young people. So FDA estimates that 85% of African-American smokers actually use menthol cigarettes. This is about 29% for white smokers. Now, this is not a coincidence. This is because of years of targeting and advertising towards those demographic groups that has been documented in other research uh, of menthol cigarettes to basically African-Americans. Now, if you go back and look at the 
FDA proposal, uh, there are four themes or four reasons that are stated for banning menthols in particular. One is that they want to say, okay, we want to reduce the level of nicotine addiction and dependence. So these are quotes from that FDA proposal. The combined effects of menthol and nicotine in the brain are associated with behaviors indicative of greater addiction to nicotine compared to nicotine alone. So basically there's some interaction between menthol cigarettes and like menthol and nicotine and nicotine alone. And then another goal is to just reduce overall cigarette consumption. Uh, on top of that, the, the another concern is that folks will start smoking menthols, and this is a gateway effect, because menthols are less harsh on your lungs, because as I said, they have this cool minty flavor. So this can act as a gateway effect, and overall we'll have more smokers. And then another thing is to improve health outcomes, particularly among minority communities like African Americans, or you know, underprivileged communities where you know mental consumption might be higher there. In this research, we cannot speak to all of these things. We can comment on things like you know whether mental bans would reduce you know mental cigarette consumption. To what extent would it sort of you know substitute to non-mental cigarettes? And how effective are mental bans? So basically, I'm hoping by the end of this talk, we would have something to say about these two. Right, uh, whether these goals can be achieved and to what extent they can be achieved with local bans. Now, uh, the research goal is basically to evaluate the effect of mental bans, and there has been limited research that analyzes retail data. There is some good research, and my slides might be a little bit outdated from 2022 to now. There might be more papers. I apologize if, if my literature review is not comprehensive. But what we are going to do to study this problem, we're going to look at the first state in the U.S. that actually imposed the mental ban. And that was Massachusetts. In June 2020, Massachusetts implemented a statewide mental ban. And what we are going to do is to measure the changes in mental and non-mental sales inside and outside Massachusetts after the mental ban took place. So some of the research questions that we are going to answer is A, for instance, how much demand for mental cigarettes actually got diverted to other states or led to basically cross-border shopping? And then how effective was the ban in terms of reducing overall cigarette sales if, for instance, there is some cross-border shopping? And the other question is, if this policy and outright ban is not super effective, what are some alternative policies that, that might do better? Perhaps a tax, right? So maybe a ban doesn't work, perhaps a tax, or how would have a policy, like a national ban would do in this case? So these are some questions that I'm hoping we can answer. So if you look at the paper and this presentation, there are two themes of sort of questions that, that we're trying to answer. One is looking at the specific example of Massachusetts. So how did the 2020 Massachusetts mental ban affect the sales and consumption of cigarettes? Just one question. The other thing is, what would have happened, so counterfactual analysis, if the government or local regulators had passed alternative policies instead? So let's first look at you know, Massachusetts. The goal is to first quantify the realized reduction in cigarette sales and consumption among folks who live in Massachusetts, both for mental cigarettes and normal cigarettes, non-mental cigarettes. So most of the analysis here is going to be reduced form demand estimation. It's going to be differences and differences, but we have to be careful about what are the regions that actually get treated because of this policy versus what regions don't get treated because of it. And then the current literature, there is at the point we're doing this research, there were a couple of papers, but they had some shortcomings, which I will discuss in a bit, some examples. And once we do that, we want to move on and basically predict the hypothetical reduction in cigarette sales had the government done something else, right, among Massachusetts sort of residents. So for that, we are going to estimate a structural demand model where consumer utility will depend on, well, how far they are from different borders, their preference for menthol or non-menthols prices or other demand shocks. Now, there are no recent papers that actually comment on alternative policies like a mental tax or a nationwide mental ban using this sort of natural experiment that, that, that we have. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. 
Okay, so just some anecdotal evidence. Again, by no means this is a lit review. This is just some examples from the literature. These are examples using survey data on how different mental bands would do. Okay, so for instance, this is survey data from Canada. Canada banned uh, mental cigarettes a while back, and it says that 20% of Canadian mental smokers continue to smoke sort of mental cigarettes. As you move towards more local bands, right? you will see that the effectiveness seems to decline. For instance, in San Francisco, 70% of San Francisco menthol smokers continue to smoke menthols after the ban. It's also sort of, you know, obvious because it's still accessible. Okay, so in terms of Massachusetts, the question is, uh, where do we stand? Okay, now this research is between a broader research in marketing, I mean marketing, there's lots of good literature and economics as well. Again, this is not a... Uh, comprehensive lit review, I apologize if I'm missing many, many good papers. So broadly, when we think about, you know, tobacco policy, we think about limitations that are imposed on some of the marketing mix of these tobacco companies. It can come from the product itself, like plain packaging laws. It can be on the assortment regulation on e-cigarettes. It can be excise taxes, which is pricing. It can be promotion, which is anti-smoking ads and public usage restrictions. Or we also have a paper on product placement. Uh, product placement is one of the last resorts for tobacco companies to reach uh, you know, big audiences. And, and you know, there's lots of cigarette product placement these days. The question is, how does that affect demand? This research is going to look at the placement or availability of cigarettes, which is how would imposing a ban or a tax on menthol cigarettes affect demand? Okay, so there are, or there were at the point we were doing this research papers that were precisely looking at the Massachusetts, Massachusetts menthol ban. So, uh, and then the, the results are quite different from one another and for different reasons. For instance, Kingsley find limited evidence of cross-border shopping by looking at aggregate time trends and retail sales. The limitation is that there is really no econometric model. There's no control group. Uh, the, the, uh, the analysis doesn't account for trends and seasonality. As we will see, uh, sales of cigarettes are very seasonal. And uh, when you are looking at cross-border shopping, this paper or some other papers in the literature, look at the entire state rather than you know narrow areas around Massachusetts. The problem is, uh, you know, Massachusetts is, for instance, neighbors with New York. New York has a public population of about 20 million, Massachusetts about six. If you want to look at you know spillover effects to all the states around it, you are going to dilute that effect quite a bit. So it's very easy to get a null effect, but that null effect is going to be you know, that very small effect on other states is going to be a very big spillover. So you have to look at the narrow area. That's why our retail sales is going to be useful. Another paper we found uh, actually showed that the total cigarette sales in Massachusetts declined. This one doesn't account for cross-border shopping. That would be a little bit misleading for the regulator in Massachusetts because, you know, the residents, if the residents are, you know, buying the cigarettes outside, they won't get the health benefits. Uh, and then... There was another paper, for instance, that actually showed that the ban has backfired and the overall consumption has gone up. The, 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 the paper uses wholesale shipments and uh, uses neighboring states as a control group. Well, obviously, the neighboring states are also getting treated. So, so that also you know, might create results that, that are you know, um, not in line with what happened. Uh, and because you know, they're using wholesale, it might not actually reflect the consumption because these things are storable. So to summarize, there are some potential issues. Even though the research question seems easy, it's tricky to analyze it empirically because A, you have to account for cross-border shopping. The stores near the border, even within Massachusetts, will see a different pattern than stores away from the border. There is a heterogeneity in preference for cigarettes and specifically menthol cigarettes. If you have a store that is near the Massachusetts border and only 16% of its cigarettes are menthols, the level of the treatment on this store is going to be very different than a store that is farther away from the border or a store where the share of menthols is larger. 
Now, the other issue is that it depends which border you are at. If you are at the Massachusetts border with New Hampshire that has much lower prices, even before the ban, it was very enticing to actually go buy your cigarettes in New Hampshire. Now, after the ban, it becomes even more, you know, incentive compatible for the residents to go. So these effects also depend on what are the other nearby options and on which border you're looking at. And the other problem is that cigarettes are easily storable in retail warehouses. So looking at wholesale purchases may not be a good proxy, at least if your you know, time horizon is small, for actual retail sales. Now, the other problem is that cigarette sales are very seasonal. So it's important to have a proper control group, control for trends, because these things can also generate noise. You will have noisy null effects. Now, we are going to use Nielsen data and the process that an issue that is going to be there for us is that Nielsen samples different proportion of stores in different states. So we have to actually rebate our store level observations when calculating sales changes at, at the state level. Okay, so let me just jump into the data. The data set we are going to use is Nielsen Retail Measurement Service. It has the sales of all products at a large set of unnamed establishments ac across the United States. In this case, we're going to use cigarette sales, and they're in different formats, grocery, drugstore, mass merchandise, or convenience stores. Each observation is going to be a product store week or a UPC store week. The key variables you observe there is sales quantity. Think of it in terms of packs, uh, prices, and whether it was menthol or non-menthol. And we have the store location, the exact zip code of the store. OK. In the Massachusetts, obviously this data is available outside and we're gonna use the data outside as well. I'm just gonna uh, show you a sneak peek of how the data looks like inside Massachusetts. We have about 83 brands. Uh, the period we are gonna look at uh, goes from January 2019 to end of 2020. So it's a two year period. And uh, the mental ban was effective in June, 2020. Uh, there are two flavors and we have about 550 stores. The number of store flavor weeks, which is the unit of observation, is basically 110K plus. Okay. Now, let's look at when the mental ban went into effect. So uh, I always will have a control group uh, and the control group is usually USA minus New England and New York. So USA minus the neighbors of Massachusetts and Massachusetts just to make sure that those regions are not treated by the ban. And then we're going to look at Massachusetts. There's other options for this. There is synthetic control, stuff like that, that you can do that are in the tendencies of the paper. The results are similar. OK, so this is the ban goes into effect. You see that the sales of menthol cigarettes for Massachusetts goes down to zero. That's what you expect. And you see that, the, you know, the trends prior, you know, they track each other very well. So it's not a terrible control group. Now, if you look at sales of non-menthol cigarettes inside the state of Massachusetts, compare it with the control, you will see that non-menthols went up. So they deviate from the trend. This dashed line is the ban. The sales of non-menthols inside Massachusetts goes up. Okay. This basically tells you there is some extent of substitution to non-menthols inside the state. That's expected. Menthols are banned. What's the close substitute inside the state? Non-menthols, I'm going to substitute to that. Now, let's look at the total cigarette sales in Massachusetts. This is menthols plus non-menthols and compare it against the control group we had. We see that the total cigarette sales, not consumption, sales goes down in Massachusetts relative to control. Now, just looking at these, you can just run a difference in differences or synthetic control and you can say, well, menthol sales in cigarettes went to zero. And we saw a sizable sort of increase in non-menthol cigarette sales substitution within Massachusetts. So some menthol smokers switched to non, some menthol smokers actually switched to non-menthols after the ban. And then you can conclude that the total Massachusetts cigarette sales went down. This is all fine. But then it might be tempting to say, well, it basically means that many menthol smokers stopped smoking or reduced their consumption quite a bit, which led to the overall decline in cigarette sales. Now, this is problematic because some of the Massachusetts smokers might have been buying you know, their cigarettes outside the state even before the ban was implemented. 
because for instance, New Hampshire has much lower prices. After the ban, they're even more incentivized to buy cigarettes outside because now menthols are not available inside and there are lower prices outside in some states. So to properly characterize the ban's effect on Massachusetts smokers, we need to measure this cross-border shopping behavior, okay? Now, I'm going to go to the empirical analysis. Uh, is this the place that I had to pause? Is there any questions that, that people might have? Uh, thank you. I think uh, we will turn to our discussion to Dr. Michael Dadden first. Audience, please submit your questions through Q&A and we'll have them answered. Thank you. Thanks, C. Yeah, so um, Ali, great great talk so far. And I, I just want to say that the paper is just really, really nice example of a, a paper that builds up from data to econometrics to structural modeling. And so if there are any students in the, in the audience who are, are interested in this stuff, I, I would really recommend looking at their paper as a model um, for how to construct empirical analysis. It's really nicely done. Um, most of my questions are actually about the structural model towards towards as we as we move forward. And so I'm actually going to just ask one now. Um, and it's more of a general question. If you could just tell us, um, you know, in, in your setting, you're, you're looking at a policy that's going into effect in June of 2020. And, you know, obviously COVID is going on during this period. Can you just tell us how you and your co-authors discussed the implications of COVID for both internal and external validity? So internal validity, because you might be concerned of differential things going on in Massachusetts, but also external validity in the sense that uh, this is just a really special time in, in American history. Yeah, so there is a, uh, a couple of things. To the extent that COVID generally affects consumption or trends or how people purchase, um, the good news is that at least for reduced for, and I know you're talking about the structural analysis, at least for reduced for both the treatment and control are sort of treated similarly. It's not like one part of the US was hit by COVID, the other parts were not. There's also synthetic control stuff like that, which, which shows that the results are 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 going to be uh, consistent i think one concern you might have is for instance covid might reduce the mobility of smokers so to the extent we're worried about that like they might not drive out that much right so so that might uh underestimate or overestimate the traveling cost in our case sadly we can't do much about it but given the large extent, it basically means that local bands are even more prone to, uh, to, to fail uh, in normal times, right? Um, that also basically maybe is the reason, perhaps is the reason why you don't find any effect if you aggregate at state level, because the effects are small, it gets diluted down. And that's why other research might have suggested that all oh, local bands are effective. So, so I think there is there's both of these things. In in this case, we look at a narrow region, we can get the effect, but I don't think we can do much about, you know, if the travel cost has been affected, which it might be, um, uh, I think it basically means that we are gonna underestimate the extent to which uh, SP lower is gonna happen outside and, and perhaps to some extent overestimate how well it hacks would work. Although I don't see why the travel costs would affect the tax differently from, mm -hmm. from the ban, right? So I think qualitatively the results would remain similar, but, uh, but I think uh, it's a good point. The answer is there's not much I can do uh, if you really believe the traveling cost is gonna be affected. There's a newer ban in California Somebody can, the California state is also a little bit different. Massachusetts is a small state. A lot of the population is near the state borders. It's not really like driving from Boston to, to the border is not the long drive, right? Or even suburban areas of Boston. In, in California, a lot of the regions are far away from the border. So uh, we would expect the results to be different, but I think, um, you know, you can definitely go and look and see what happens there at the border um, to see whether the traveling cost is comparable. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, I agree. There's nothing you can really do. It's all about interpretation and just kind of what you yeah. um, So uh, just really quickly, I mean, so 
in the literature that you've looked at, has anyone actually looked at consumption, cigarette consumption, or you know, from something like the Burfus for Massachusetts, like doing a, a diff and diff with, with with those kind of data, just to try to get at some of these kind of demographics characteristics, yeah, like I, like age particularly. Uh, that's uh, again another. It's a good point that uh, BRFSS data whether uh, you can actually get enough of these folks to to find reasonable effects. At the time we're writing the paper, mm -hmm. we couldn't find the studies. That's why I put a big disclaimer that, folks, I wrote this paper two years ago. There <laughs> might be something in the past two years, and, and we are just simply not aware of it. Uh, but we couldn't find anything back then. Um, you need a large number of panelists in the data um, to also be able to document, like you also need the location of these people. I don't think BRFSS has exact location. Does it? What's the fine level? Of I think it's just state. It's state. a state, right? Yeah. So there's yeah. a lot of variation if you're near the border versus you're farther away from the border. Yeah. We tried to do it with Nielsen Home Scan panel. Nielsen has a number of panelists, about fifty thousand to sixty thousand uh, across the U.S. that they report whatever they buy. Well, you can see that if uh, Massachusetts is about 5 million, U.S. is 300 million, what portion of those are in Massachusetts? And if the smoking rate is about 10 to 20 percent, what portion of there are, yeah, you know, yeah, smokers, yeah. what portion are mental smokers? Then you run into very small. So store level data was much richer. So we never um, could do the household household level. Or okay, no, yeah, I just wanted to think about some of those because, it, because so much of the impetus of this was for for the for the young people in initiation, but um, that's all that's all I've got. So I'll I'll yield back to to see and um, uh, ask questions later. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, Melanie Dove just uh, sent us a birthday study that may be relevant. So I'll pass that link to you both. Uh, there's a question from uh, Amos Hausner um, and uh, asking about the New Hampshire variable. So uh, this is a relatively small state and the tax revenue reports there can show whether there was an increase of sales of cigarettes of all brands therein. So I'm guessing if you can use that to see whether the general sales of cigarettes in nearby states increased. That is a very good point. And the figure is actually in the paper. So if you go to the published version of the paper, this was one of the points that in the review process came out. At the time, we just had 2020 data. And one of the concerns in the review process was like, well, it's the short run effect. Maybe in the long run, people deviated and you don't see that much. So we went and we got uh, tax because tobacco taxes are reported. And as the uh, as it's correctly pointed out in the comments, New Hampshire is fairly smaller. And if there's a large volume going to New Hampshire, you will see even at aggregate level taxes jump. And they are absolutely correct. They jump and they stay up. So if you scroll down in the published version of the paper, there's a figure there, or maybe in the in the appendices, if you go to SSRN in the appendices, either in the body or in the appendices, I, I'm not sure, Simha, maybe you can help me here. Okay, link to the full paper is here. Simha? Um, I, I believe that it's in the appendix, it's not in the main paper. Okay, so it's in the appendix. If you go and uh, the 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 person who is asking the question is absolutely right, you will see that. Great, I think we clear all the questions in the Q&A. Please continue, thank you. All right, so let's look at a little bit finer now. Let's look at the 30 mile region around Massachusetts and let's look at different states. So the 30 mile region around Massachusetts covers different states. It's, you know, Vermont, Rhode Island, New York, New Hampshire, Maine, and Connecticut. This paper really helped me learn the geography of the US and not being from here. Anyway, so if you look at it, you will see a, a big jump in New Hampshire sales in that region. And, and it's again, indicative of a large spillover, especially to New Hampshire, you will see jumps for other states like Maine or, you know, Rhode Island as well, but the New Hampshire is pretty pronounced. Now, the question that becomes next is then how do you figure out what is the relevant area that you have to focus on when you are looking at the spillover effect? Is it the 10 mile ready? Is it the 20 mile ready? Is it 50 miles? So to do that, 
they basically took all the states around Massachusetts, which is basically New England plus New York. We took out Massachusetts. We created this distance band, 10 miles, 20 miles, 30, 40, 50, and the rest of the New England and New York. And we ran a triple defendive. And I'm not going to show you many sort of specifications, but basically what we want to see is we want to see up to what point can we observe an abnormal increase in the sales of menthols relative to non-menthols. You could imagine if people go out to buy cigarettes, it's mostly menthols. It could be non-menthols also go out, but the preference should be mostly for menthols because menthols are bad. So we want to see up to what point can we measure at store level, abnormal increases in the sales of menthol or to non-menthol, the triple difference is going to allow us to control the very fine level fixed effects even at the store level, which basically we are going to precisely measure what is the region that is going to be treated by this policy directly. So we did this with several other specifications. You can add more finer fixed effects. What we find is that it seems like the relevant you know, region is up to 30 miles. After that, uh, we consistently get nuts. So the most conservative is to just look at 30 miles. That being said, we still remove the rest of New England and, and, and New York. So we look at Massachusetts and the Massachusetts ring, a 30 mile ring around Massachusetts versus the rest of the United States, less New York and New England. So this is how the, the ring, the 30 mile ring around Massachusetts look, looks like, which our analysis basically says that the spillover is probably limited to this area. It's an area that is similar in size to, to Massachusetts. In terms of consumption, not consumption, sales of cigarettes as well, it, it has a similar sales to the states of Massachusetts. Interesting, okay. now. We are going to again revisit our figure. Mental ban goes into effect. The sales of mental cigarettes goes down relative to the control group, which is again United States minus New England and New York. This is the 30 mile ring around Massachusetts. You can see that the sales of mental cigarettes shoots up. There's a substantial amount of cross border shopping, especially for mentals. Now, what's more interesting is if you look at non-mental sales, this figure I showed you before, this is Massachusetts, this is simply substitution to non-mentals inside Massachusetts. But what's more surprising is that if you look at the 30 mile ring around Massachusetts, non-mentals go up. So it's probably because some people are co-purchasing these things. Not only they shift some of these mentals, they also shift non-mentals to this region. Not as big as a spike that we saw before, but there is shift even in non-mentals. That also tells you that if you just look at Massachusetts, you're going to heavily underestimate the, the effects of the policy in terms of cross-border shop. Okay, now if you look at the total cigarette sales, well, it goes down in Massachusetts here, but in the 30-mile ring around Massachusetts, it goes up quite a bit. Now, you can do some analysis, and then you can see what's the implication for Massachusetts consumption. You have to do some, some adjustments here, because when you say sales, like non-menthol sales or menthol sales went up in Massachusetts plus 30, like Massachusetts and 30 mile around it, uh, you have to rebate it. It's like it's, those of you who are familiar with ITTATT, the real treatment is, is, is in Massachusetts. So you need to rebate these things a little bit, but the... Final thing that, that you, will, you will find, I'm going to pass this, is basically an analysis done here. So we're going to have this region, which is Massachusetts. Region 2 is another region that is indirectly treated by the policy, spillover effect. We're going to remove this entire area, and this is going to be our control. Now, you can imagine why other research can't find spillover effects, because they're looking at this entire yellow plus this area to see whether there was an effect. This area is huge relative to Massachusetts, right? So the effects get diluted a lot. Now, if you don't control for trends, stuff like that properly, you'll have a noisy knot, which is not, not super informative. Okay, so the, the, we are gonna estimate a very simple sort of uh, reduced form demand model. It's gonna be a log log demand model. You have log quantities sold on uh, block prices. You control for a price index. You have, you know, the time trend, post-span, you have some fixed effects. Some of these fixed effects will absorb these two coefficients. 
um, as we move towards more you know, fine level fixed effects. And then you have the, uh, the interaction between the treated sort of unit, which the treated unit is Massachusetts plus the 30 mile ring around it. And then the interaction effect after the band. Now, once you do this analysis, and once you translate it to the effects for Massachusetts, so this is a change in Massachusetts demand, not sales, right? So you can now so go and extrapolate what does it mean for demand for Massachusetts because you can measure how much of you know demand then to MA plus thirty. You will see that the mental sales and in, in mental consumption in Massachusetts went down by about fifty four percent. Okay, now this led to a seventeen percent increase in non mental sales. I want to point out that these percentages are not compar comparable a little bit because 54% uh, of about 30 some percent of cigarette consumption, right? So that is a much less reduction than the non-mental sort of sort of increase. So to, to find the net effect on all cigarettes, we'll find that the ban has probably reduced the cigarette sale, cigarette consumption by about 4%. Okay. So this is basically, you know, this is much less than what's being reported as the effect of this ban. Because now we have accounted for the fact that some of the non-menthols went out, some of the menthols went out. And we do the math and, and then we realize after some accounting that you know, it's about only 4%. Okay. Now, uh, the next step is we want to now build a structural model to figure out what, how would counterfactual policies do. And there were some limitations to this analysis. For instance, this analysis I showed you here doesn't account for the fact that already some of the sales or some of the consumption in Massachusetts comes from sales outside the state. So Michael just pointed out there is CDC surveys and these BRFSS that reports on consumption. And there is also taxes you get from the state. And there's a mismatch. Some of the states are net importers. Some of them are net exporters. You can do that math and then you'll get a ratio of what is the sales that is already happening outside before the ban. And then that information is quite useful. Maybe you want to use it somehow. And in order to use it, now you have to build a model where consumers now or smokers now have a preference over different characteristics. So uh, which is the distance from the borders, prices, uh, their preference for menthol over non-menthol. So in a nutshell, what I'm going to show you very quickly before I run out of time is to estimate a structural model. I'm not going to show you a structural model. I'm going to tell you what kind of variation is going to be helpful to do these extrapolations. So we get an intuition. And um, basically the consumer utility is going to depend on distance of the store relative to the border. A, a store that is near the New Hampshire border and stops selling menthols, perhaps a larger portion of its menthols go to the out of the state rather than being substituted to non-menthols because it's more accessible. There, there's a nearby border that has low prices. There's preference for menthols versus non-menthols. There's prices, seasonality. And at the time, again, when we were writing this paper, there were no papers that were trying to model this using a structural model and figure out how would an alternative policy do because the current policy, the ban, seems to lead to substantial um, you know, demand spillovers to, to other states. And this is basically not great for Massachusetts because it doesn't get the health benefits. It loses a lot on tobacco revenue so perhaps another policy might deliver on reduction, but also, you know, not hurt the tax revenues that much. Okay, so the key factors or variations, the data is going to be variation from state borders. So some stores are located near the state borders. Some of them are located farther away. As I told you, the culprit seems to be the New Hampshire state. So a lot of it goes to New Hampshire. So if you do a simple analysis and look at the stores that are near New Hampshire versus stores that are farther away, you see that the extent of substitution to non-mentals is less than when they are near the border. Because it's easy to go to New Hampshire and get it cheap. Why would I substitute to non-mentals, which I don't prefer anyways? Okay. Now there's variation in prices. There is a large amount of variation. Uh, New Hampshire again has the lowest prices compared to, uh, to other states and compared to Massachusetts. There is also variation in how much uh, sort of different markets or different users in different markets prefer mentals, right? So if you look at the stores in our data, the shares of mentals vary quite a bit. 
So if your sales, for instance, 30% of your sales are menthols, then you get treated more because the extent of substitution to non-menthols is probably higher. Now combine that if you're near the border, the effect should be less. So these types of variations are gonna help us sort of identify how people have preference if this is over distance, prices, and also to what extent it translates into substitution as opposed to going out, right? We have aggregate level moments, which we got from the reduced form analysis, which tells us something about what portion on aggregate should go out. And we also have aggregate level moments, which what portion already goes out. So these are the aggregate level moments that sort of uh, try to put uh, some structure on the structural model so that these things make sense. Once we do that, uh, we basically have a model where people might just quit smoking. Uh, they might uh, buy cigarettes locally, either a menthol, so the green ones are menthol, the red ones are normal flavor, or they might choose to go to one of the nearby states. Now you can imagine if you are uh, near uh, it's like Connecticut uh, and far away from New Hampshire, the utility here is going to be higher because the distance is low. Now, what's interesting in our model, we actually don't observe how much of your sales goes here. Because remember, we are looking at store level data. I only, the only thing I see is the extent of substitution to non mentals and how strong it is, depending upon how far you're from these different borders and how our price is competitive and those aggregate level moments. So things are identified by the extent of substitution and the aggregate level moments we got from the reduced form analysis and from the, uh, from the CDC data, which basically tells you the extent of sort of uh, cross-border shopping that is already happening at Massachusetts. Once you do this analysis, you can now look at different uh, sort of policies so if uh, this, this is just comparing what would, what would happen in the no-band state. So this is the mental in-state sales. This is the non-mental in-state sales. And this is how much was happening already. Remember, I told you this, this model accounts. So this is how much non-mental and mental we think is happening. Those we have is direct the statistics on it. And this is what happens after the ban. As you can see, there is this, this, this part of the pie goes up. The non-mental part also goes up. And then we can now put a restriction and say, what if there was a national ban? Now, if there was a national ban, as you can see that the, the things come down. So if you do the, the analysis, uh, you realize, well, maybe bans, the statewide bans are not great uh, because you don't reduce that much and a lot of it goes out. Uh, so national ban could be more effective in terms of reducing cigarette sales. But something else is that it doesn't lead to, again, obviously, to people substituting a lot out of this state, right? Now, you might be asking the question, well, I'm a local regulator. I want to do something about this. What are other alternatives? This is either a federal ban versus Massachusetts ban. So federal ban is better in terms of just reducing the spillover effects. There are alternative policies that local policymakers have. Namely, one of them is taxes. So one thing that happens when you do a full menthol ban is, well, full menthol ban would reduce the menthol cigarette sales by about, you know, 40 some percent here. Okay. This is again, Massachusetts ban. It would reduce the total cigarette consumption by four some percent. These are from the structural model. But there is a curve you could have moved on, which is taxes. If you had increased the taxes by 1.5 per pack, then what would happen is that your tax revenue would go up and you would reduce the consumption by some amount, right? You cannot go all the way here, but you can have you know, very restrictive taxes that actually doesn't hurt your tax revenues. But note that when you go to the full mental ban state, simply by the sheer substitution to other states, cross-border shopping, now your, your tax revenue is hurt quite a bit as well you're earning about 20% less. So there's a there's a wide array of sort of options that, that we have. It seems like at least if you're in Massachusetts, the smallest state, where a large portion of the poor population is within a low distance of the, of the borders, uh, it might be the case that tax revenues uh, are more effective and actually increase your, your, your tobacco taxes, which you can spend to, to to lower cigarette sales uh, using other means. 
Now, basically what I want to do is to just summarize about half of the pre-band Massachusetts mental consumption was diverted to neighboring areas, which is usually within 30 miles of state border. Total uh, Massachusetts cigarette consumption did not decrease by a sizable amount, to be precise, about 4%. The main reasons for this ineffectiveness is, as I said, Massachusetts is a small state, and it's neighboring state that has very low taxes and prices on cigarettes, and a large portion of the population is not far away from that border. Now, if you look at alternative policies, statewide mental ban, you know, reduces consumption of about 5%, nationwide would reduce about 7%. If you put a tax, uh, well, pretty large tax, then you would, uh, you would actually increase the uh, tax dollars from tobacco, about 180 million. This revenue could be spent on other anti-tobacco initiatives. Let me give you an example. The Massachusetts Tobacco Cessation Prevention Program, NTCPP, uh, only received about $4.2 million in state funding in 2019. You can easily increase it by you know, a large amount. Um, and that concludes, I think I'm on time. Yes, thank you. Um, very interesting results. And audience, please submit your questions through Q&A. Uh, let's turn to our lesson, Dr. Darden. Um, Michael, first uh, to see whether he has any comments. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, this has been great. Um, yeah, I mean, I, so I want to uh, just think a little bit about the motivation for the, the ban from the perspective of the regulators and get your thoughts about how that gels with the structural model. So, so the Tobacco Control Act doesn't allow FDA to prohibit all cigarettes. So there, there, there must be something specific to menthols here to allow them to, to do this. And they wrote a preliminary regulatory impact analysis where they said, you know, we think that a ban is going to help people to align their preferences and their behavior and reduce negative internalities. So FDA was explicitly saying they think that they think <clears throat> They're claiming that a reason for this ban is that menthol cigarettes are making mistakes that are different in some way or more severe or you know, significant in some, in some respect relative to non-menthol cigarette smokers. And you've got a structural model here that's, you know, that's a very that doesn't allow for that, basically, right? So like if menthol cigarette smokers are present biased or they're like lacking information in some way, the kind of classic internalities that we think about in, in welfare analysis, um, you know, I don't see how you would identify those parameters in with the data that you've got, right? Yeah. Like, it may, these may be the mechanisms that are driving the, the, the difference, the, the, the substitution patterns and the kind of cessation uh, outcomes that you're recording. And so I, I, I wondered to, I wanted to just kind of get your thoughts on those mechanisms and 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 how that fits in like at all into your thinking. Yeah, so I think uh, you're going around sort of a rational addiction model and basically saying perhaps my previous sort of uh, addiction stock or consumption stock uh, affects my current utility more for menthols versus less. That that's where you're going at, and that's why they're more addictive. Sadly, that requires um, you know individual level data, right? Uh, our well, data is aggregated. It could be, it could, I mean, it's it's not necessarily about the addiction stock. I mean, that, there there could be a rational response to that. That's the symmetric. I mean, the FDA was explicitly thinking that menthols were associated with these mistakes that non-menthols weren't. Yeah, um, I have seen those results as well. They're citing a few papers. There are also other papers that show that it's not necessary. There's one paper, for instance, by Yan Wen Wang. I think it's cited in our, uh, and then they they mm -hmm. show that it's not like menthols are, uh, at least by any definition we have, are more addictive or less addictive than than non menthols. There is a there was a job market candidate uh, which is I think you're going to be your colleague. Yep. Uh, Julia yep. also had some comments on that, and she actually found the opposite, right. if I'm not mistaken. So I I would say a lot of that research also has very mixed findings, right? right. So, um, yeah, I don't have a very good answer. We don't definitely have answer. That's why we don't comment on that a lot. 
but at least we can say to what extent substitution did happen. And right. we see a lot of it happened, right? To what extent did people go away? We cannot say much about these uh, things that you say, you know, they're making mistakes. Perhaps if I nudge them, they will internalize some of these things. Uh, that I cannot comment on. Uh, but all I know is there is research related to what you're mentioning and the findings are very mixed, right? So, this, yeah, so that that's fine. Yeah, I, mean, I just I, I thought that, you know, some of that underlying motivation might be important here. Um, so so in terms of the substitution patterns, um, you know, can you speak at all about that? Like the, the decision to make the, the market level here a store and, and thinking about... Uh -huh. You know, so does this cause a bias with respect to substitution between menthols and non-menthols, um, yeah, as opposed to kind of thinking about like uh, a, a market, a typical market where you might have some competitive effects uh, mm. across pro across stores within a product? Mm. Yeah, so that's a very good point. Um, when we were thinking about this, we debated a lot what should be a market, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, there is uh, some literature in marketing. I mean, usually the default is you just do market and the market size is X times. But mm -hmm. you, are, you are very correct that there could be some dynamics. I don't go buy from this store. I go from another store, right? But the, the problem is, again, even in our data, the structure model, the identification is very, very narrow. Everything is identified from the extent of substitution from mental to non-mental, let's say you have the 30%, only 5% of it gets substituted, right? And it's now probably explained by, oh, I was near a border where mentals were very available. Now, adding that other layer of complexity of how did the competition look like around me didn't sound first order in terms of a band that treats the, the, the stay. But, but you're right, if we had some data on the extent of connectedness of the stores, right? So maybe you could, uh, you know, combine one of these data sets where it has mobility across the stores, right? So you could you could impose some more restrictions, but it was not apparent to us but how, how should we model it. Uh, so we didn't think that was the first order issue. But, yeah. but you're right, you could have, uh, you could have made the market bigger it was not clear to us how to group the stores, how would, because you don't observe if it went from this store to that there. All you observe, like that's the key thing about, that's why you need all of these aggregate level moments. All you observe is you have, let's say 40% mental. And in this store, it turned into a 20% substitution. In this other, it turned into a 10% substitution. And I have an aggregate level moment, which basically tells me across the stores, here is what I should get for the reduction from the reduced form. And here is what should be the traveling even before the ban because of the BRFSS or CDC relative to the tax. So um, this, this was already you know, pushing them all to the limits. Like you're identifying everything by substitution, yeah. yeah. No, I mean to be clear, I think you're. I mean, the, I think you're using the right data, and it's you know, the, the, there's not much more that can be done with these data, and so it's just a question of interpretation. Um, one one more question on the structural model. Uh, you know, so um, it, I think I think the I think the counterfactual of a national ban is of course the interesting one, and so I see why you've built the model to try to 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 to, to answer that question. Um, Thinking about some of the unmodeled factors that could be relevant in a national ban, but might not necessarily be relevant in a state ban. Uh, so could you speak to just the supply side response to a national ban versus a state level ban and the extent of, of black markets uh, in a national ban versus a state ban? So, uh, you know, it, it, for a state ban, you'd think, you know, maybe tobacco companies producing menthols wouldn't behave very differently at all. Uh, but obviously they would change their behavior a lot uh, in, the, in, in a national ban and they might substitute more towards e-cigarettes, for example. Uh, yeah, they might also respond in terms of pricing, right? Right, right. Uh, lots of responses, right. Yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, we are assuming a very lots of this uh, sort of GE general equilibrium responses where, where obviously if the United States is treated 
Right. Uh, your Philip Morris, you're gonna change the prices, right? For you know, for for normal cigarettes. So that's something that is very hard to to predict how it will go. Regarding black markets, um, if you're concerned about, I would say, look, uh, I think you're concerned about basically cigarettes being smuggled into the United States. Uh, is that the concern? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. I think I think there's some evidence that cigarettes are produced here, they go abroad, then they come back. Yeah. So, right? so like in a national ban, that's a real concern. And, you know, in, in the context of just the state ban that identifies all the parameters here, you know, black markets, uh, it sounds like there's already potentially a black market in, in Massachusetts because of the high taxes. But there are clear workarounds here, as yes. you documented very nicely, of just going outside of the state. Yeah, so uh, I think you're right. And if you see in the paper, they're very careful to say this is probably the effect on Massachusetts if there is a national ban. Okay. Right? okay. Which, okay. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so I cannot predict what would happen nationally. Uh, even then, even then, because of the responses you mentioned, uh, even then that, that you should you should treat that with caution. Because now if there's a price response, uh, you know, uh, what we wanted to point out is that if there's a national ban, these spillovers are much less, right? These uh, tax spillovers and tax losses, uh, which I think that point is still true. It's sort of obvious from the reduced form results as well. The other thing we wanted to point out uh, is, um, as you knew, as you correctly point out, national ban is the end of the spectrum in terms of counterfactual. But if you're a local regulator, there's other tools you have which probably won't have that big of a GE response, right? A local tax, right? Uh, if Massachusetts, instead of a ban, had gone with a tax, I don't think there would be a big price response because it's just Massachusetts. Uh, mm -hmm. The current prices are probably still, you know, okay. And they would not be hurt so much by losing tax revenues to neighboring states like New Hampshire and stuff like that. And it's not just losing tax revenues, less tax revenues because New Hampshire is now charging less per pack. So the uh, in terms of overall welfare is going down. So uh, I think what we wanted to basically point out is that here's one end of spectrum that you correctly point out. And we said it's the effect on Massachusetts. Yeah. And then here's another for local sort of regulators, but you're you're absolutely right about these things. That's a great paper. I really enjoyed it. Um, see, I'll I'll kick it back to you. Thank you. Uh, so I think Simha has cleared all the questions in Q and A, but I do want to ask uh, um, some questions that have been repeated by audience, which is regarding the spillover effects and how long that may last. Uh, because the figures also show the meso sales increase in stores close to the border seem to show declining sales over time. So um, I think the audience is uh, wondering that if you plan to um, further examine the long-term uh, consequences. Yeah, this. the only reason it ends in 2020 is that Nielsen has a requirement that gives the data with a two-year lag. Right, so we had uh, we did this research in 2022, and this was the most recent sort of thing that came out. There was a person in the audience who asked the question, which I think speaks to that a little bit. If there were declining patterns, you would see New Hampshire revenues reflect that, right? And New Hampshire revenues, when you see the bump, again, super aggregate level data, but the bump is big enough that you can see it's just fairly stable and you can see the declining in Massachusetts tax revenue is also stable. Uh, again, I think that that figure is for farther than 2020. So this was one of the concerns that came up that maybe it's just the short run, but uh, at that point, the tax revenues were available for longer, I think for 2021 as well. And it's in one of the appendices. So I, I'm not super concerned that that is gonna go away. Uh, I think we have time for the last question uh, from Johan uh, about uh, whether there are any tools that Massachusetts can use uh, to make cross-border stores not sell to people who reside in MA uh, in Massachusetts. You know, is there any way that they can influence cross-border shopping? <laughs> well, I'm no regulator, but that, uh, like, look, it would involve you know, cooperation from stakeholders, 
that maybe don't have the incentive to like you have to enforce something in New Hampshire. I don't see why New Hampshire would would I don't know, maybe there is a I don't know why New Hampshire would cooperate in something like this because they're gonna lose tax revenues. Uh, the other thing that I didn't comment on here is now I think we did a little bit comment on it in the paper. What concerns me more is a large portion of folks who smoke these cigarettes are African American. Now, if you end up crossing the border and buy a few cartons of cigarettes and come back and the state trooper stops you, I think they can charge you with smuggling or stuff like that into the state because those have, uh, you know, if, if it's more than some volume. Uh, so uh, the crime that it creates, I mean, now it's a crime, right? Uh, and they, you have more incentive too because you are the one addicted to it. So um, the extent of uh, differential effect it might have on, on these minorities is something that I think is also interesting. We comment on it a little bit. We can't say much. But, uh, but yeah, I don't have an answer. How would you limit it? But I can see that it's a big problem. And it's a big problem for underprivileged folks as well. So yeah. I think we can bring the discussion to the top of the tops later. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we'll tell our MC to take us out. Yeah. And uh, audience, if you want to have a group discussion, please check the uh, information message in the chat box, which has the link to tops of the tops. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time now. So however, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Goli, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following Slack Tops event this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch room with us once the event concludes. We will leave the webinar room open for an extra minute after the end of the given and to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is bit.ly slash tops meeting, all in lowercase. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience for of 170 people for your participation. Have a tops notch weekend. Thank you.